Looks like quite a few folks are trying to build the circuit. Remember, the Hartley oscillator using the 6J5 or some other triode is perfectly legal on the air. You might want to run it through a filter if you're a little bit nervous, but using a resonant antenna, this thing being low power, it should have no problems with harmonics that would give anyone problems. Also, um, if you want to use it in the contest, uh, you, you need to use a type that was developed in the 1920s, and I'll give you a list of these tubes. Let's take a look at some of these typical tubes that you could use in the same circuit. The Hartley oscillator was very popular in the 20s, and uh, a man named Ross Hull, who was the ARRL's technical, really a technical director, his fir the first technical director of the ARRL, um, he recognized that not everyone had the funds to be able to produce a state-of-the-art type ham station. And people were building on breadboards like this, on pieces of wood. So he came up with kind of a best principles breadboard design that he published, uh, basically to clean up the bands a little bit, because it was pretty... Uh, pretty bad sounding uh, transmitters that were on the air in the 20s from people building things like this and uh, perhaps they didn't have the greatest layout discipline or maybe they didn't have a great power supply and uh, there was a lot of uh, strange sounding signals on the air. So this guy, he basically gave them a reference design, one of the very first reference designs where you could look at his article and you could figure out how to build a Hartley properly. So it's interesting to look at how he's built this. You can see he's got the tube way up on the, uh, on the design to keep the heat away from uh, any parts that might be influenced by thermal uh, heat rise. And he's keeping the leads extremely short, really, really tight, really tight construction, much tighter than this construction. So he was going for uh, kind of an ultimate Hartley oscillator physical design. So as you go along, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to give you a pictorial diagram because I do recognize that people have problems following electrical or schematic diagrams sometimes, and they could benefit from having something that represents the, the build in a point-to-point -point picture type mode. So I went ahead and I did an illustration that shows how this thing is wired. It wasn't too hard to do the illustration in one of my uh, programs, but uh, this should help some of you get started. Again, this is high voltage, so if this is your first time around a vacuum tube type power supplies, be very, very careful. And if you don't want to build a power supply, there are choices out there. You can buy a high voltage power supply used and you can use a regular DC low voltage supply to light up the tube. So here we go. This is video number three on the Hartley oscillator. We're going to go through this reference design 6J5 oscillator first, and then we're going to modify it for the real thing, the Type 27 triad. So the first thing you notice as you look down on the breadboard is this huge coil here. What's that all about? Well, that coil is the radio frequency choke. It's a solenoid wound radio frequency choke which takes the place of this very fine Miller choke. And I substituted that choke in for the solenoid and there was no difference in power output. So we have plenty of inductance and there's no self-resonance. It's 150 turns of number 28 on a 2-inch form. Close wound. Very similar to something you'd use for a crystal radio. The coupling capacitor is a 0.01 capacitor. Okay. So I do have voltage on this, so I have to be careful. Now, the, the first and most important part of this transmitter is the grounding. And as far as ground goes, there's no chassis, so where's the ground? Well, it's actually just a piece of number 14 enameled wire 
It starts here at the power supply ground and it moves all the way over to the key jack which this plate is grounded. Then the ground works down this way to the tube socket. The tube socket is grounded. The ground continues down and makes its way to the output connector. This is grounded. Then the ground goes underneath the coil to the center tap and comes up to the center tap. The ground continues off that point and goes to the front panel. The front panel is grounded. Notice that there is an insulated coupler between the front panel and the capacitor because both sides of the capacitor are hot. Therefore we can't just um, put a shaft to this front part and short it or it will short out the coil. So th those are all the grounds. The ground starts here, works under to the center tap, out to the output connector, works its way across to the tube socket, and then goes to the key jack, and then back to the power supply. That is the grounding system. It's, it's trying to mimic what we had on our schematic diagram. The next thing that's important is lighting up the tube. That, that is here with these two yellow wires, the 6.3 volts going to pin 2 and 7 of the tube to light it up. Uh, next the high voltage comes in on the red wire and it goes immediately over to the choke. From the choke it comes out to the coupling capacitor and uh, at, at that same point we have to go to the plate of the tube. So this point goes to the plate of the tube and we have a suppression network at that point. Okay, next uh, let's talk about the keying. The keying is here and I've got this fabulous Black Beauty key shaping capacitor at this point. That goes over to the cathode of the tube. We have the grid left. The grid goes to the rotor, which is the frame of the capacitor. The rotor is the frame. To the grid with a 10K resistor and a 270 puff capacitor. So I think we've gone through just about all of the wires. There's not much to it. So there it is. The entire oscillator with a 6J5 the output coupling link can swing. In other words, we can move this link out. So with the swinging link, we can loosen the coupling or we can tighten the coupling. And you just tighten the screw to put it in the place you want. So that's a pretty simple transmitter. And it gives you a place to start. Now the 150 volts didn't give us any more than one watt out. But one watt out is very encouraging. If you can get one watt out of a 6J5, then think what you could do at, say, 200 volts, or 250 volts, or 275 volts, and tempt the devil, and see if you can get more power out of it. However, you will find that you may need to loosen up the link coupling as you increase the power output, because you're not going to get that beautiful note that we're getting now once you start to put more dissipation into the tube. You're going to get more drift, the uh, signal may get a little dirtier. Right now we have a beautiful sine wave coming out of this thing. It might not be so sweet at 275 volts on a 6J5. Just a little bit more discussion on winding the choke. You remember we got the original information from the 1926 handbook, the number of turns dependent on a 3-inch diameter form. Now I am using a 2-inch diameter form so as you can see with my lesser diameter I have to have more turns to get an equivalent inductance so that the choke is invisible and allows the tuned circuit to have all of the energy. Remember the choke is providing a high impedance to ground from the RF so we don't have any waste, wasted power to ground. And of course the DC is going through the choke. But number 28 or number 30 wire will have no problem at all with uh, 20 or 30 or 40 milliamps. If you use 150 turns, I think that might be a good compromise for 80 and 40 meters. My particular wind is 150 turns 
and it's working okay. But you might want to try 200 turns to get even more efficiency on 80 meters. The other question is, will this capacitor begin to break down? Well, I was kind of surprised it didn't break down to begin with, but it was fine. And uh, so far, so good. How fast does it tune? Let's listen to that. I'll open up the squelch. Okay. Now, during the contest, you hear a lot of that. There's people that actually do it this way. They don't have a vernier on there. They don't have anything. And that's what you hear. You hear this sweeping back and forth of somebody... trying to net you with something like that. So I highly encourage putting a vernier on it or using a fixed capacitor to make the tuning at least a little bit slower. Right now, I have no fixed capacitor in the tuned circuit. And as you key on the table, of course, you'll get some wobulation. If I'm up here in, and I'm keying in my hand, sounds good. But when I'm on the table, keying, that's... You want to isolate all vibrations. There are three points on this coil where I have stability. The end, the middle, and the other end of the coil. With this number 10 wire, it doesn't give you a lot of stability. That's another reason why we like to use the tubing. The tubing would be more stable than this number 10 wire. Grandpa, he actually used copper strap a lot of the time. And copper strap is even more stable than uh, tubing or wire. So it would be nice to know how much uh, current drain we have on this thing. Remember we predicted a 5K resistor and uh, the voltage dropped about 10 volts under load. It went from around 160 down to 150. So let's see what our drop is in the real world with the 6J5. Okay, there's our 164 volts. I'm going to close the key. five or six volts so the the current drain is not as much as we designed for and that's why we have such a pleasant note it's really a well-regulated power supply so we were kind of designing around the 50 milliamp drain and I don't think we're anywhere near that because we're not taking uh, the power supply down that far twenty milliamps 20 milliamps and 150 volts. That's our input power. 20 milliamps across 150 volts. Power output. Looks like we're getting a watt. One watt out. I'm not going too crazy there. I did play with the 10K bias resistor and you can increase the power a little bit. But getting a watt out with 150 volts with a 6J5, we're going to call that good enough. Remember that all of these diagrams and schematics and pictures are available on my Facebook page, the Microwave One Radio Resources. And also, uh, don't forget to get your 5-pin Type 27 tube socket mounted on the chassis, because the next time you see this, the Type 27 tube is going to be on the wood.